Witch of the Demon Seas by Poole Anderson. Part One. Crowman the Conqueror, Thalassocrat of Akera, stood watching his guards bring up the captured pirates. He was a huge man, his hair and square-cut beard jet black despite middle age, the strength of his warlike youth still in his powerful limbs. He wore a plain white tunic and purple-trimmed cloak. The only sign of kingship was the golden chaplet on his head and the signet ring on one finger. In the gaudy crowd of slender, chattering courtiers he stood out with a brutal contrast. "'So they finally captured him,' he rumbled. "'So we're finally rid of Corun and his seagoing bandits. Maybe now the land will have some peace.' "'What will you do with him, sire?' asked Shorzon the sorcerer. Croman shrugged heavy shoulders. "'I don't know. Pirates are usually fed to the Irenes at the games, I suppose, but Corun deserves something special.' Public torture, perhaps, sire. It could be stretched over many days. No, you fool. Corun was the bravest enemy Akera ever had. He deserves an honorable death and a decent tomb. Not that it matters much, but Shorzon exchanged a glance with Caresis, then looked back toward the approaching procession. The city Taurus was built around a semicircular bay a huge expanse of clear green water on whose surface floated ships from halfway round the world, the greatest harbor for none knew how many empty sea leagues, capital of Akera, which, with its trade and its empire of entire archipelagos, was the mightiest of the Thalassocracies. Beyond the fortified sea walls at the end of the bay, the ocean swelled mightily to the clouded horizon gray and green and amber. Within, the hulls and sails of ships were a bright confusion up to the stone docks. The land ran upward from the bay, and Taurus was built on the hills, a tangle of streets between houses that ranged from the clay huts of the poor to the marble villas of the great. Beyond the city walls on the landward side, the island of Vakera lifted still more steeply, a gaunt rocky country with a few scattered farms and herds. Her power came all from the sea. A broad, straight road lined with sphinxes ran straight from the harbor up to the palace, which stood on the highest hill in the city. At its end, wide marble stairs lifted toward the fragrant imperial gardens in which the court stood. Folk swarmed about the street. Mobs strained to see the soldiers as they led their captives toward the palace. The word that Corun of Conahor, the most dangerous of the pirates, had finally been taken, had driven merchants to ecstasy, and brought insurance rates tumbling down. There was laughter in the throng, jeers for the prisoners, shouts for the king. Not entirely so, however. Most of the crowd were, of course, Akarans a slim, dark-haired folk, clad generally in a light tunic and sandals, proud of their ancient might and culture. They were the loudest in shouting at the robbers. But there were others who stood silent and glum-faced, not daring to voice their thoughts, but making them plain enough. Tall, fair men from Conahor itself, galled by the Akaran rule, fur-clad barbarians from Noriki, blue-skinned savages from Umlatu, with a high professional regard for their fellow pirate, slaves from a hundred islands who had not ceased dreaming of home and remembered that Corun had been in the habit of freeing slaves when he captured a ship or a town. Others might be neutral, coming from too far away to care, for Corun had only attacked Akaran galleys, the black men from the misty Orzaban, the copper-colored Chilatsis, the yellow wizards from the mysterious Heung Nu. The soldiers marched their prisoners rapidly up the street. They were mercenaries, blue Umlotuans in the shining corslets, greaves, and helmets of the Akaran forces, armed with the short sword and square shield of Akara, as well as the long halberts which were their special weapon. 
When the mob came too close they swung the butts out with bone-snapping force. The captive pirates were mostly from Konahur, though there were a number of other lands represented. They stumbled wearily along, clad in a few rags, weighted down hand and foot by their chains. Only one of them, the man in the lead, walked erect, but he strode along with the arrogance of a conqueror. "'That must be Koran himself there in the front of them,' said Caresis. "'It is,' nodded Shorzon. They moved forward for a better look. Imperceptibly the court shrank from them. Croman's adviser and daughter were feared in Tauros. Shorzon was tall and lean and dry, as if the heaven-fire beyond the eternal clouds had fallen on him and seared all moisture out of the gaunt body. He had the noble features of the old Acheron aristocracy, but his eyes were dark and sunken and smoldering with strange fires. Even in the warmth of midday he wore a black robe falling to his feet, and his white beard streamed over it. Folk knew that he had learned sorcery at Thiongnu, and it was whispered that for all Croman's brawling strength it was Shorzon who really dominated the realm. Croman had married Shorzon's daughter. None knew who her mother had been, though it was thought she was a witch from Hyungnu. She had not lived long after giving birth to Caresis, whose grandfather thus came to have much of her upbringing in his hands. Rumor had it that she was as much a witch as he was a warlock. Certainly she could be cruel and ungovernable. But she had a strange dark beauty over her that haunted men. There were more who would die for her than one could readily count, and it was said had died after a night or two. She was tall and lithe, with night-black hair that streamed to her waist when unbound. Her eyes were huge and dark in a face of coldly chiseled loveliness, and the full red mouth denied the austere, goddess-like fineness of her countenance. Today she had not affected the heavy gold and jewels of the court. A white robe hung in dazzling folds about her, and there might as well not have been another woman present. The prisoners came through the palace gates, which clasped shut behind them. Up the stairs they went, and into the fragrance of green trees and bushes, blooming plants, and leaping fountains that was the garden. There they halted and the court buzzed about them like flies around a dead animal. Croman stepped up to Karun. "'Greeting,' he said, and there was no mockery in his voice. "'Greeting,' replied the pirate in the same even tones. They measured each other, the look of two strong men who understood what they were about. Karun was as big as Croman, a fair-skinned giant of a man in chains and rags. Weather-bleached yellow hair hung to his shoulders from a haughtily lifted head, and the fire-blue eyes were unwaveringly on the king's. His face was lean, long-jawed, curved-nosed, hardened by bitterness and suffering and desperate unending battle. A chained Irene could not have looked more fiercely on his captors. "'It's taken a long time to catch you, Karun," said Croman. "'You've led us a merry chase.' Once I almost had the pleasure of meeting you myself. It was when you raided Seropolis, remember? I happened to be there, and gave chase in one of the war galleys, but we never did catch you. One of the ships did. Corun's voice was strangely soft for so big a man. It didn't come back, as you may recall. How did they finally catch you? asked Croman. Corun shrugged, and the chains about his wrists rattled. "'You already know as much as I care to talk about,' he said wearily. "'We sailed into Iliantis Bay and found a whole fleet waiting for us. Someone must finally have spied out our stronghold.' Croman nodded, and Karun shrugged a shoulder. "'They blocked off our retreat, so we just fought till everyone was dead or captured. These half-hundred men are all who live. Unfortunately I was knocked out during the battle and woke up to find myself a prisoner.' Otherwise—his blue gaze raked the court with a lashing contempt. 
I could be peacefully feeding fish now instead of your witless fish eyes. I won't drag out the business for you, Corun, said Croman. Your men will have to be given to the games, of course, but you can be decently and privately beheaded. Thanks, said the pirate, but I'll stay with my men. Croman stared at him in puzzlement. But why did you ever do it? he asked finally. With your strength and skill and cunning, you could have gone far in Akira. We take mercenaries from conquered provinces, you know. You could have gotten Akiran citizenship in time. I was a prince of Konohor, said Korun slowly. I saw my land invaded and my folk taken off as slaves. I saw my brothers hacked down at the Battle of Lear, my sister taken as concubine by your admiral, my father hanged, my mother burned alive when they fired the old castle. They offered me amnesty because I was young and they wanted a figurehead. So I swore an oath of fealty to Akera and broke it the first chance I got. It was the only oath I ever broke, and still I am proud of it. I sailed with pirates until I was big enough to master my own ships. That is enough of an answer. It may be, said Croman slowly. You realize, of course, that the conquest of Conahor took place before I came to the throne? and that I certainly couldn't negate it in view of the Philosocrat's duty to his own country, and had to punish its incessant rebelliousness. I don't hold anything against you yourself, Croman, said Coron with a tired smile, but I'd give my soul to the nether fires for the chance to pull your damned palace down around your ears. I'm sorry it has to end this way, said the king. You were a brave man. I'd like to drain many beakers of wine with you on the other side of death. He signed to the guards. Take him away. One moment, sire, said Shorzan. Is it your intention to lock all these pirates in the same dungeon cell? Why, I suppose so. Why not? I do not trust their captain. Chained and imprisoned, he is still a menace. I think he has certain magical techniques. That's a lie, spat Caron. I've never needed your stinking woman's tricks to flatten the likes of Akira. I would not leave him with his men, advised Sharzan imperturbably. Best he be given his own cell alone. I know a place. Well, let it be so. Croman waved a hand in dismissal. As Sharzan turned to lead the guards off, he traded a long glance with Caresis. Her eyes remained hooded as she looked after the departing captives. End of Part 1 Part 2 The cell was no longer than a man's height, a dripping cave hewed out of the rock under the palace foundations. Corun crouched on the streaming floor in utter darkness. The change, which they had locked to ring bolts in the wall, clashed when he stirred. And this was how it ended, he thought bitterly. The wild career of the exiled conqueror, the heave and surge of ships under the running waves, the laughter of comrades and the clamor of swords, and the thrum of wind in the rigging, had come to this. One man, hunched in a loneliness and darkness like a colder womb, waiting in timeless murk for the day when they would drag him out to be torn by beasts for the amusement of fools. They fed him at intervals, a slave bringing a bowl of prison swill, while a spear-armed guard stood well out of reach and watched. Otherwise he was alone. He could not even hear the voices of other captives. There was only the slow dripping of water and the harsh tones of iron links. The cell must lie below even the regular dungeons, far down in the very bowels of the island. Vague images floated across his mind, the high cliffs about Iliantis Bay, the great flowers blooming with sullen fires in the jungle beyond the beach, the slim black corsair galleys at anchor. He remembered the open sky, the eternally clouded sky, under which blew the long wet winds, out of which spilled rain and lightning, and grew the eerie blue of dusk. 
he had often wondered what lay beyond those upper clouds. Now and then he remembered one could see the vague disk of the heaven-fire, and he had heard of times when incredibly violent storms opened the brief rift in the high cloud layers to let through a shaft of searing brilliance at whose touch water boiled and the earth burst into flame. It made him think of the speculations of Conaher's philosophers that the world was really a globe around which the heaven-fire swung, bringing day and night. Some had gone so far as to imagine that it was the world which did the moving, that the heaven-fire was a ball of flame in the middle of creation about which all other things revolved. But Conahor was in chains now, he remembered. Its folks bowed to the will of Akera's greedy proconsuls, its art and philosophy the idle playthings of the conquerors. The younger generation was growing up with an idea that it might be best to yield, to become absorbed into the phallosocracy, and so eventually gain equal status with the Akerans. But Koran could not forget the great flames flapping against a wind-torn night sky, the struggling forms at ropes' ends swaying from trees, the long lines of chained people stumbling hopelessly to the slave galleys under Akaran lashes. Perhaps he had carried the grudge too long. No, by Brunach Branner, there had been a family which was no longer. That was grudge enough for a lifetime. A lifetime, he thought sardonically, which wouldn't be very much protracted now. He sighed wearily in the stinking gloom of the cell. There were too many memories crowding in. The outlaw years had been hard and desperate, but they'd been good ones, too. There had been song and laughter and comradeship and gigantic deeds over an endless waste of waters. The long blue hush of twilight the soft black nights, the gray days with the sea running gray and green and gold under the squalls of rain, the storms roaring and raging, the eager leap of a ship, frenzy of battle at the taking of town or galley, death so close one could almost hear the beat of black wings, orgy of loot and vengeance, the pirate town, grass huts under jungle trees, stuffed with treasure, full of brawling body life, the scar-faced swaggering men and the lusty insolent women, ruddy firelight hammering back the night while the surf thundered endlessly along the beach. Well, all things come to a close. And while he would have wished a different sort of death for himself, he didn't have long to wait in this misery. Something stirred far down the narrow corridor, and he caught the flickering glow of a torch. Scowling, he stood up, stooped under the low ceiling. Who in all the hells was this? It was too soon for feeding, unless his time since had gone completely awry, and he didn't think the games could have been prepared in the few days since his arrival. They came up to the entrance of the cell, and stood looking in by the guttering red torchlight. A snarl twisted Corun's lips. Sharzan and Caresus. Of all the scum of a Kara, he growled, I had to be inflicted with you. This is no time for insolence, said the sorcerer coldly. He lifted the torch higher. The red light threw his face into blood-splashed shadow. His eyes were pits of darkness in which smoldered two embers. His black robe blended with a surrounding shadow. His face and hands seemed to float disembodied in the dank air. Corun's eyes traveled to Caresus. And in spite of the hate that burned in him, he had to admit, she was perhaps the loveliest woman he had ever seen. Tall and slim and lithe, moving with the soundless grace of a Sanduvian ferrax, the dark hair sheening down past the chill sculptured beauty of her marble white face, she returned his blue stare with eyes of dark flame. She was dressed as if for action, a brief tunic that left arms and legs bare, a short black cloak and high buskins, but jewels still blazed at throat and wrists. Behind her padded a lean shadow, at sight of which Corun stiffened. 
He had heard of Caresis's tame Irene. Folk said the devil-beast had found a harder heart in the witch's breast and yielded to her. Some said less mentionable things. The slitted green eyes flared at Corun, and the cruel muzzle opened in a fanged yawn. Back, Piraeus, said Caresis evenly. Her voice was low and sweet, almost a caress. It seemed strange that such a voice had spoken the rituals of black sorcery and ordered the flaying alive of a thousand helpless Isarian prisoners and counseled some of the darkest intrigues in Akera's bloody history. She said to Corun, This is a fine end for all your noble thoughts, man of Konohor. At least, he answered, you credit me with having had them, which is more than I'd say of you. The red lips curved in a cynical smile. Human purposes have a habit of ending this way. The mighty warrior, the scourge of the seas, ends in a foul prison cell waiting for an unimaginative death. The old epic slide, didn't they? Life isn't quite the glorious adventure that fools think it to be. It could be if it weren't for your sort, wearily. Go away, won't you? If you won't even let me talk with my old comrades, you can at least spare me your own company. We are here with a definite purpose, said Shorzan. We offer you life, freedom, and the liberation of Konohor. He shook his tawny head. It isn't even funny. No, no, I mean it, said Caresis earnestly. Shorzan, had you put in here alone, not out of malice, but simply to make this private talk possible, you can help us with a project so immeasurably greater than your petty quarrels that anything you can ask in return will be as nothing. And you are the one man who can do so. I tell you this so that, realizing you have some kind of bargaining position, you will meet us as equal to equal, not as prisoner to captor. If you agree to aid us, you will be released this instant." With a sudden flame within him, Corun tautened his huge body. Oh, gods! Oh, almighty gods, beyond the clouds! If it were true— His voice shook. What do you want? Your help in a desperate venture, said Caresis. I tell you frankly that we may well all die in it. But at least you will die as a free man, and if we succeed, all the world may be ours. What is it? he asked hoarsely. I cannot tell you everything now, said Shorzan. But the story has long been current that you once sailed to the lairs of the Xanthi, the sea demons, and returned alive. Is it true? Aye. Corun stiffened, with sudden alarm trembling in his nerves. Aye, by great luck I came back. But they are not a race for humans to traffic with. I think the powers I can summon will match theirs, said Shorzon. We want you to guide us to their dwellings, and teach us the language on the way, as well as whatever else you know about them. When we return, you may go where you choose, and if we get their help, we will be able to set Konohar free soon afterward." Karan shook his head. "'It's nothing good that you plan,' he said slowly. "'No one would approach the Xanthi for any good purpose.' "'You did, didn't you?' chuckled the wizard dryly. "'If you want the truth, we are after their help in seizing the government of Akera, as well as certain knowledge they have. If you succeed, argued Corun stubbornly, why should you then let Konohar go? Because power over Akera is only a step to something too far beyond the petty goals of empire for you to imagine, said Shorzon bleakly. You must decide now, man. If you refuse, you die. Caresis moved one slim hand, and the Irene padded forward on razor-clawed feet. The leather wings were folded back against the long black body, 
the barbed tail lashed hungrily, and a snarl vibrated in the lean throat. "'If you say no,' came the woman's sweet voice, "'Pereus will rip your guts out. That will at least afford us an amusing spectacle for our trouble.' Then she smiled, the dazzling smile which had driven men to their doom ere this. "'But if you say yes,' she whispered, a destiny awaits for you that kings would envy. You are a strong man, Karun. I like strong men. The corsair looked into the warm, dark light of her eyes and back to the icy glare of the devil beast. No unarmed man had ever survived the onslaught of an Irene, and he was chained. At thought of returning to the dark home of the Xanthi, he shuddered. But life was still wondrous sweet, and, once free to move about, he might still have some chance of escape or even of overpowering them. Or who knew? He wondered, with a brief giddiness, if the dark witch before him could be as evil as her enemy said. Strong and ruthless, yes, but so was he. When he learned the full truth about her soaring plans, he might even decide they were right. In any case, to live, to die if he must, under the sky. I'll go, he said hoarsely. I'll go with you. The low, exultant laughter of Caresis sang in the flare-lit gloom. Charzon came up and took a key from his belt. For a bare moment the thought of snapping that skinny neck raged through Corun's mind. The magician smiled grimly. Don't try it he said, as a small proof of what we can do. Suddenly he was not there. It was a monster from the jungles of Umlotu, standing in the cell with Korun, a scaled beast that hissed at him with grinning jaws and spewed poison on the floor. Sorcery! Korun shrank back, a chill of fear striking even his steely heart. Shorzan resumed human shape and wordlessly unlocked the chains. They fell away, and Karun stumbled out into the corridor. The Irene snarled and slipped closer. Caresis laid a hand on the beast's head, checking that gliding rush as if with a leash. Her smile and the faint, sweet scent of her hair were dizzying. Come, she said. One hand slipped between his own fingers and the cool touch seemed to burn him. Charzon led the way down a long, sloping tunnel where only the streaming torch flames had life. Their footsteps echoed hollowly in the wet, black length of it. "'We go at once,' he said. "'When Croman learns of your escape, all Taurus will be after us. But it will be too late, then. We sail swiftly tonight.' "'Sail? Whither?' What of my men? asked Corun. They're lost, I'm afraid, unless Croman spares them until we get back, said Caresis. But we saved you. I'm glad of that. A faint smell of fresh, salty air blew up the tunnel. It must open on the sea, thought Corun. He wondered how many passages riddled the depth under Taros. They came out, finally, on a narrow beach under the looming western cliffs. The precipices climbed into the utter dark of night, reaching into the unseen sky. Before them lay open sea, swirling with phosphorescence. Corun drew deep lungfuls of air, salt and seaweed and wet wild wind, sand under his feet, sky overhead, a woman beside him. By the gods it was good to be alive! A galley was moored against a tiny pier. By the light of bobbing torches, Corun's mariner's eye surveyed her. She was built along the same lines as his own ship. A lean black vessel with one square sail, open-decked save at stem and stern, rover's benches lining the sides with a catwalk running between. There would be quarters for the men under the poop and forecastle decks, supplies in the hold beneath. A cabin was erected near the waist, apparently for officers and there was a ballista mounted in the bows, otherwise no superstructure. 
A carved sea monster reared up for figurehead, and the stern post carved back to make its tail. He read the name on the bows, Brasea. Strange that that dark vessel should bear a girl's name. About a fifty-man capacity, he judged, and she would be fast. The crew were getting aboard. They must have come down the cliffs along some narrow trail. They were all Umlotuan blues, he noticed, a cutthroat gang if ever he saw one, but silent and well-disciplined. It was shrewd to take only the mercenary warriors along. They had no patriotic interest in what happened to Akera, and their reckless courage was legendary. A burly, one-eyed officer came up and saluted. "'All set, sir,' he reported. "'Good,' nodded Sharzan. "'Captain Imazu, this is our guide, Captain Koron.' "'The raider, eh?' Imazu chuckled and shook hands in the manner of the barbarians. "'Well, we could hardly have a better one, I'm sure. Glad to know you, Koron. The pirate murmured polite phrases, but he decided that Imazu was a likable chap, and wondered what had led him to take service under anyone with Shorzon's reputation. They went aboard. "'The Sea of Demons lies due north,' said Shorzon. "'Is that the right way to sail?' "'For the time being,' nodded Koron. "'When we get closer I'll be able to tell you more exactly.' "'Then you might as well wash and rest,' said Caresis. "'You need both.' Her smile was soft in the flickering red light. Karun entered the cabin. It was divided into three compartments. Apparently Imazu slept with his men, or perhaps on deck, as many men preferred. His own tiny room was clean, sparsely furnished, with a bunk and a washbowl. He cleaned himself eagerly and put on the fresh tunic laid out for him. When he came back on deck the ship was already under way. A strong south wind was blowing, filling the dark sail, and the brasea surged forward under its thrust. The phosphorescence shone around her hull and out of the rolling waters. Behind the land faded into the night. He'd certainly been given no chance to escape, he thought. Barring miracles, he had to go through with it now, at least until they reached the Sea of Demons, after which anything might happen. He shivered a little, wondering darkly whether he had done right, wondering what their mission was and what the world's fate was to be as a result of it. Caresis slipped quietly up to stand beside him. The Iridi crouched down nearby, his baleful eyes never leaving the man. Outward bound, she said, and laughter was gay in her voice. He said nothing, but stared ahead into the night. "'You'd better sleep, Karun, she said. "'You're tired now, and you'll need all your strength later.' She laid a hand on his arm and laughed aloud. "'It will be an interesting voyage, to say the least.' "'Rather,' he thought with wry humor. It occurred to him that the trip might even have its pleasant aspects. "'Good night, Karun, she said, and left him. Presently he went back to his room. Sleep was long in coming and uneasy when it did arrive. End of Part 2 Part 3 When he came out on deck in the early morning there was only a gray emptiness of waters out to the gray horizon. They must have left the whole Akaran archipelago well behind them and be somewhere in the Zorian Sea now. There was a smell of rain in the air and the ship ran swiftly before a keening wind over long white-maned rollers. Karun let the tang of salt and moisture and kelp, the huge restless vista of bounding waves, the creak and thrum of the ship and the thundering surge of the ocean swell luxuriously up within him, the simple animal joy of being at home. The sea was his home now, he realized vaguely. He had been on it so long that it was his natural environment, his as much as that of the Loridae wheeling on white wings in the cloud-flying heavens. He looked over the watch. It seemed to be well handled. The sailors knew their business. There were armored guards at bow and stern, and the rest, clad in plain loincloth of ordinary seamen the world over, 
were standing by the sail, swabbing the decks, making minor repairs, and otherwise occupying themselves. Those off duty were lounging or sleeping well out of the watch's way. The helmsman kept his eye on the compass and held the tiller with a practiced hand. Good, good. Captain Imazu padded up to him on bare feet. The Omlotuan wore helmet and corslet, had a sword at his side, and carried the whip of authority in one gnarled blue hand. His scarred, one-eyed face cracked in a smile. "'Good morning to you, Captain Corrin,' he said politely. The Conahorin nodded with an amiability he had not felt for a long time. "'The ship is well handled,' he said. "'Thanks.' I'm about the only Umlotuan who's ever skippered anything larger than a war canoe, I suppose. But I was in the Akaran fleet for a long time." Again the hideous but disarming smile. I nearly met you professionally once or twice before, but you always showed us a clean pair of heels. Judging from what happened to those ships that did have the misfortune to overhaul you, I'm just as glad of it. He gestured to the tiny galley below the poop deck. How about some breakfast?" Over food, which was better than most to be had aboard ship, they fell into professional talk. Like all captains, Imazu was profoundly interested in the old and seemingly insoluble problem of finding an accurate position. "'Dead reckoning just won't do,' he complained. Men's estimates always differ, no matter how good they may be. There isn't even a decent map to be had anywhere. Karun mentioned the efforts of theorists in Acheron, Konohor, and other civilized states to use the Heaven Fire's altitude to determine position north and south of a given line. Imazu was aware of their work, but regarded it as of little practical value. "'You just don't see it often enough,' he objected. "'And most of the crew would consider it the worst sort of impiety to go aiming an instrument at it.' That's one reason, I suppose, why Shorzon shipped only Umlotuans. We don't worship the heaven fire. Our gods all live below the clouds." He cut himself a huge quid of Liangzi and stuffed it into his capacious mouth. Anyway, it doesn't give you east and west position. The philosophers who think the world is round say we could solve that problem by making an accurate timepiece," said Karun. I know. But it's a lot of gas, if you ask me. A sand glass or a water clock can only tell time so close and no closer. And those mechanical gadgets they built are worse yet. I knew an old skipper from Nariki once who kept a joss in his cabin and got his position in dreams from it. Only had one wreck in his life, Imazu grinned. Of course he drowned then. Look, said Karun suddenly, do you know where the hell we're going and why? To the Sea of Demons is all they told me. No reason given." Imazu studied Karun with his sharp black eye. "'You don't know either, eh? I've a notion that most of us won't live to find out. I'm surprised any crew could be made to go there without a mutiny. <laughs> this gang of bully boys is only frightened of Shorzon and his witch granddaughter. They—' Imazu shut up. Looking around? Karun saw the two approaching. In the morning light, Caresis did not seem the luring devil woman of the night. She moved with easy grace across the rolling deck, the wind blowing her tunic and her long black hair in careless billows, and there was a girlish joy and eagerness in her. The pirate's heart stumbled and began to race. She chattered gaily of nothing while she and the old man ate. Charzon remained silent until he was through, then said curtly to the two men, "'Come into the cabin with us.' They filled Karun's tiny room, sitting on bunk and floor. Charzon said slowly, "'We may as well begin now to learn what you know, Karun. What is the truth about your voyage to the Xanthi?' "'It was several seasons ago,' replied the Corsair. I got the thought you seem to have had, that possibly I could enlist their help against my enemies." He smiled mirthlessly. <laughs> I learned better. "'What do we know of them exactly?' said Shorzon methodically. He took the points off on his lean fingers. 
They are an amphibious, non-human race dwelling in the Sea of Demons, which is said to grow grass so that ships become tangled there and never escape. Not so, said Corun. There's kelp on the surface, but you can sail right through it. I think the sea is just a dead region of water around which the great ocean currents move. I know, said Shorzon impatiently, and resumed his summary. Generations ago the Xanthi, of whose presence men had only been vaguely aware before, fell upon all the islands in their sea and slew the people living there. They had great numbers as well as tamed sea monsters and unknown powers of sorcery, so that no one could stand against them. Since then they have not gone beyond their borders, but they ruthlessly destroy all human vessels venturing inside. King Phidion III of Akera sent a great fleet to drive the Xanthi from their stolen territory. Not one ship returned. Men now shun the whole region as one accursed. Imazu nodded. There's a sailor's legend that the souls of the damned go to the Xanthi, he offered. Shurzon gave him an exasperated look. I'm only interested in facts, he said coldly. What do you know, Corun? I know what you just said, as who doesn't, answered the Conahorian. But I think they must have limits to their powers and be reasonable creatures. But the limits are far beyond man's, and their reason is not as ours. I didn't try an invasion, of course. I took one small fast boat manned with picked volunteers and waited outside the sea for a storm that would blow me into it. When that came, we ran before it, fast. In the rain and wind and waves, I figured we could get undetected far into their borders. So it seemed we could, and in fact we made it almost to the largest island inside. And then they came at us. They were riding Cateria and driving sea serpents before them. They had spears and bows and swords, and there were hundreds of them. Any one of the snakes could have smashed our boat. We ran for land and barely made it. We hadn't come to fight, so we held up our hands as the Xanthi leaped ashore and wondered if they'd just hack us down. But, as I'd hoped, they wanted to know what we were there for. So they took us to the black castle on the island. Momentarily, Corun was cold, as the memory of that wet, dark place of evil shuddered through his mind. I can't tell you much about it. They have great powers of sorcery, and the place seemed somehow unreal, never the same, always wrong, always with something horrible just beyond vision in the shadows. I remember the whole time as if it were a dream. There were treasures beyond counting. I saw gold and jewels from the sea bottom, mixed in with human skulls, and the figureheads of drowned ships. The light was dim and blue and there was always fog and noises, for which we had no name, hooting out of the gloom. It stank with the vile fishy smell they have. And the walls seemed to have a watery unreality, as I said, shifting and fading like smoke. You could smell sorcery in the very air of that place. They kept us there for many ten days. We'd brought rich gifts, of course, which they accepted ungraciously, and they housed us in a dungeon under guard. They didn't feed us so badly, if you like a steady fish diet, and they taught us their language. How does it sound? asked Caresus. I can't make it come out right. No human throat can. Something like this. They stiffened at the chill hissing that slithered from Corun's lips. It has words for things I never did understand, and it lacks many of the commonest human words. Fear, joy, hope, adventure. His glance slid to Caresus. Love? Do they have a word for hate? asked Shorzon. Oh, yes. Koran grinned without humor. After a moment he went on. They wanted to know more of the outside world. That was why they spared our lives. When we knew the language well enough, they began to question us. How they questioned us! It got to be torture, those unending days of answering the things that hissed and gabbled at us in those shadowy rooms. It was like a nightmare, 
where mad happenings go on without ever ending. Politics, science, philosophy, art, geography, they wanted to know it all. They pumped us dry of knowledge. When we came to something they didn't understand, such as love, say, they went back and forth over the same ground over and over again, until we thought we'd go crazy. At last they give up in bafflement. I think they believe humans to be mad. I made my offer, of course, the loot of Akera in exchange for the freedom of Conahor. They, I might almost say, they laughed. Finally they answered in scorn that they could take whatever they wanted, the whole world if need be, without my help. Sharzan's eyes glittered. Did you find out anything of their powers? he asked eagerly. A little. They put any human magician to shame, of course. I saw them charm sea monsters to death just to eat them. I saw them working on a new building on the island. They planted a little package somewhere and set fire to it, and great stones leaped into the air with a bang like thunder. I saw their Cataria cavalry, their tamed war snakes. Oh, yes, they have more powers than I could name. And their numbers must be immense. They live on the sea bottom, you know. That is, they are commoners do. The leaders have strongholds on land as well. They form both sea and land and have great smithies on the islands. Well, in the end they let us go. They were going to put us to death for our trespass, I think, but I did some fast talking. I told them we could carry word of their strength back to humans and overawe our race with it, so that if they ever wanted to collect tribute or something of the sort, they never have to fight for it. Probably that carried less weight than the fact that we had, after all, done no harm and been of some use. Their killing charms seemed to work only on animals. That was another reason to spare us. One of their wizards was for having me at least slain. He said he'd had a prevision of my return with ruin in my wake. But the others laughed at him, at the very thought of humans being dangerous to them. Moreover, they pointed out, if that was to be the case, then there was nothing they could do about it. They seemed to believe in a fixed destiny. But the idea amused them so much that it was still another reason for letting us go. Karun shrugged. So we sailed away, that's all. And never till now did I have any smallest thought of returning. He added bleakly, after a moment when silence had been heavy, they have all they want to know from my visit. There will be no reason for them to spare us this time. I think there will, said Caresis. There'd better be, muttered Imazu. You can start teaching us their language, said Shurzon. It might not be a bad idea for you to learn too, Imazu. The more who can talk to them, the better. The Umlotuan made a wry face. <laughs> Another tongue to learn. By the top knot of Mwanzi, why can't the world settle on one and end this babble? The poor interpreters would starve to death, smiled Caresis. She took Corun's arm. Come, my buccaneer, let us go up on deck for a while. There's always time to learn words. They found a quiet spot on the forecastle deck and sat down against the rail. The Irene settled his long body beside Caresis and watched Karun with sleepy malevolence, but he was hardly aware of the devil beast. It was Caresis, Caresis, dark sweet hair and dark lambent eyes, utter loveliness of face and form, singing golden voice and light warm touch and— "'You are a strange man, Karun,' she said softly. "'What are you thinking now?' Oh, nothing, he smiled crookedly, nothing. I don't believe that. You have too many memories. Almost without knowing it, he found himself telling her of his life. The long, terrible struggle against overwhelming power, the bitterness and loneliness, the death of comrades one by one, and the laughter and triumphs and wild exultance of it the faring into unknown seas, and the dicing with fate, and the strong close bonds of men against the world. He mused wistfully about a girl who was gone, but her bright image was strangely fading in his heart now, for it was Caresis who was beside him. "'It has been a hard life,' 
she said at the end. It took a giant of a man to endure it. She smiled, a small, closed smile that made her look strangely young. I wonder what you must think of this, sailing with your sworn foes to the end of the world on an unknown mission. You are not my foe, he blurted. No, never your enemy, Corun, she exclaimed. We have been on opposite sides before. Let it not be thus from this moment. I tell you that the purpose of this voyage, which you shall soon know, is good, great and good as the savagery of man has never known before. You know the old legend that some day the heaven-fire will shine through opening clouds not as a destroying flame, but as the giver of life, that men will see light in the sky even at night, that there will be peace and justice for all mankind. I think that day may be dawning, Karun. He sat dumbly, bewildered. She was not evil. She was not evil. It was all he knew, but it sang within him. Suddenly she laughed and sprang to her feet. Come on, she cried. I'll race you around the ship. End of Part 3 Part 4 Rain and wind came, a lightning-shot squall, in which the Brisea waddled and bucked and men strained at oars and pumps. Toward evening it was over, the sea stilled and the lower clouds faded so that they saw the great dull red disk of the heaven-fire through the upper clouds sinking into the western sea. There was almost a flat calm. The glassy water was ruffled only by a faint breeze, which half filled the sail, and set the galley sliding slowly and noiselessly northward. "'Man the oars,' directed Shurzon. "'Give the men a chance to rest tonight, sir,' begged Imazu. "'They've all worked hard today. We can row all the faster tomorrow if we must.' "'No time to spare,' snapped the wizard. "'Yes, there is,' said Corun flatly. "'Let the men rest, Imazu.' Shurzon gave him a baleful glance. You forget your position aboard? Karun bristled. I think I'm just beginning to remember it, he answered with metal in his voice. Caresis laid a hand on her grandfather's arm. He's right, she said. So is Imazu. It would be needless cruelty to make the sailors work tonight, and they will be better fitted by a night's rest. Very well, said Shurzon sullenly. He went into his room and slammed the door. Presently Caresis bade the men good night and went to her quarters with the Irene trotting after. Corun's eyes followed her through the deepening blue dusk. In that mystic light the ship was a shadowy half-real background, a dimness beyond which the sea swirled in streamers of cold white radiance. "'She's a strange woman,' said Imazu. "'I don't understand her.' "'Nor I,' admitted Corun. "'But I know now her enemies have foully lied about her. "'I'm not so sure about that.' "'As the Konohorian turned with a dark frown, Imazu added quickly, "'Oh, well, I'm probably wrong. "'I never had much sight of her, you know.' "'They wandered up on the poop deck in search of a place to sit. "'It was deserted, save for the helmsman by the dimly glowing binnacle, "'a deeper shadow in the thick blue twilight.' Sitting back against the taffrail, they could look forward to the lean waist of the ship and the vague outline of the listlessly bellying sail. Beyond the hull the sea was an arabesque of luminescence, delicate traceries of shifting white light out to the glowing horizon. The cold fire streamed from the ship's bows and whirled in her wake. The hull dripped liquid flame. The night was very quiet. The faint hiss and smack of cloven water, creak of planks and tackle, distant splashing of waves and invisible sea beasts, otherwise there was only the enormous silence under the high clouds. The breeze was cool on their cheeks. "'How long till we get to the Sea of Demons?' asked Imazu. His voice was oddly hushed in the huge stillness. "'With ordinary sailing weather, I'd say about three ten days, maybe four, answered Corun indifferently. 
It's a strange mission we're on, aye, that it is. Amazu's head wagged, barely visible in the dark. I like it not, Karun. I have evil feelings about it, and the omens I took before leaving weren't good. Why then did you sail? You're a free man, aren't you? So they say. Sudden bitterness rose in the Umlotuan's voice. Free as any of Shorzan's followers, which is to say, less free than a slave, who can at least run away. Why, doesn't he pay well? Oh, why, he is lavish in that regard. But he has his ways of binding servants to him, so that they must do his bidding above that of the very gods. He put his gash on most of these sailors, for instance. They were simple folk, and thought he was only magicking them a good luck charm. You mean they are bound? He has their souls? Aye. He put them to sleep in some sorcerous way and impressed his command on them. No matter what happens now, they must obey him. The gish is stronger than their own wills. Karan shivered. Are you... Pardon, it's no concern of mine. No, no, that's all right. He put no such binding on me. <laughs> I know better than to accept his offer of a luck-bringing spell. But he has other ways. He lent me a slave girl from Umlotu for my pleasure. But she is lovely, wonderful, kind, all that a woman should be. She has borne me sons and made homecoming ever a joy. But you see, she is still Shurzon's, and he will not sell her to me or free her. Moreover, he did put his gish on her. If ever I rebelled, she would suffer for it. Imazu spat over the rail. So I am Shurzon's creature, too. It must be a strange service. It is. Mostly all I have to do is captain his bodyguard. But I've seen and helped in some dark things. He's a fiend from the lowest hell, Shurzon is. And his granddaughter. Imazu stopped. Yes? asked Korun roughly. His hand closed bruisingly on the other's arm. Go on. What of her? Nothing. Nothing. I really have had little to do with her. Imazu's face was lost in the gloom, but Karun felt the one eye hard on him. Only be careful, pirate. Don't let her lay her own sort of ingesh on you. You've been a free man till now. Don't become anyone's blind slave. I've no such intention, said Karun frostily. Then no more need be said. Imazu sighed heavily and got up. I think I'll go to bed, then. What of you? Not yet. I'm not sleepy. Good night. Coron sat back alone. He could barely discern the helmsman. Beyond lay only glowing darkness and the whispering of the night. He felt loneliness like a cold hollow within his breast. Father and mother, his tall brothers and his laughing lovely sister, the comrades of youth, the hard, wild, stout-hearted pirates with whom he had sailed for such a long and bloody time. Where were they now? Where in all the blowing night were they? Where was he? And on what mission? Sailing alone through a pit of darkness on a ship of strangers? What meaning and hope in all the cruel insanity of the world? Suddenly he wanted his mother. He wanted to lay his head on her lap and cry in desolation, and hear her gentle voice. No, by the gods it was at her image he saw. It was a lithe and dark-haired witch who was crooning to him and stroking his hair. He cursed tonelessly and got up. Best to go to bed and try to sleep his fancies away. He was becoming childish. He went down the catwalk toward the cabin. As he neared it, he saw a figure by the rail, darkly etched against a shimmering patch of phosphorescence. His heart sprang into his throat. She turned as he came near. Coron, she said, I couldn't sleep. Come over here and talk to me. Isn't the night beautiful? He leaned on the rail, not daring to look at the haunting face pale lit by the swirling sea-fire. It's nice, he said clumsily. 
but it's lonely, she whispered. I never felt so sad and alone before. Why, why, that's how I felt, he blurted. Karun. She came to him, and he took her with a sudden madness of yearning. Piraeus the Irene snarled as they thrust him out of her cabin. He padded up and down the deck for a while. A sailor who stood watch near the forecastle followed him with frightened eyes and muttered prayers to the amulet about his neck. Presently the devil-beast curled up before the cabin. The lids drooped over his green eyes, but they remained unweakingly fixed on the door. End of Part 4 Part 5 Under a hot, sullen sky, the windless sea swelled in long, slow waves that rocked the tangled kelp and ocean grass up and down, heavenward and hellward. To starboard, the dark cliffs of a small jungled island rose from an angry muttering surf, but there were no birds flying above it. Karun pointed to the shore. That's the first of the archipelago, he said. From here on we can look for the Xanthi to come at any time. We should get as far into their territory as possible, even to the Black Palace, said Shurzon. I will put a spell of invisibility on the ship. Their sorcerers can break that, said Caresis. Aye, so, but when they come to know our powers I think they will treat with us. They'd better, smiled Imazu grimly. Steer on toward the island of the castle, said Shurzon to the pirate. I go to lay the spell. He went into his cabin. Karan had a glimpse of its dark interior before the door was closed, draped in black and filled with the apparatus of magic. He will have to be in a trance physically to maintain the enchantment, said Caresis. She smiled at Karan, and his pulses raced. Come, my dearest, it is cooler on the afterdeck. The sailors rowed steadily, sweat glistening on their bare blue hides. Imazu paced up and down the catwalk, flicking idlers with his whip. Karun stood where he could keep an eye on the steersman and see that the right course was followed. It had been utter wonder till now, he thought. Unending days when they plowed through seas of magic, nights of joy such as he had never known. There had never been another woman such as Caresis, he thought, never in all the world, and he was the luckiest of men. Though he died today, he had been more fortunate than any man ever dared dream. Caresis, Caresis, loveliest and wisest and most valiant of women, and she was his. Before all the jealous gods she loved him. There has only been one thing wrong, he said. You are going into danger now. The world would go dark if aught befell you. And I should sit at home while you are away and never know what had happened, never know if you lived or died? No, no, Karun. He laid a hand on the sword at his waist. They had given him arms and armor again after she had come to him. Logically enough, he thought without resentment, he could be trusted now as much as if he were one of Shurzon's ensorcelled warriors. But if this were a spell, too, the gods deliver him from ever being freed of it. He blinked. There was a sudden breath of chill on him, and his eyes were blurring. No, no, it was the ship that wavered, ship and men fading. He clutched at Caresis. She laughed softly and slipped an arm around his waist. "'It is only Shurzon's spell,' she said. "'It affects us, too, to some extent, and it makes the ship invisible to anyone within seeing range. Ghost ship, ghost crew, slipping over the slowly heaving waters. There was only the foggiest outline to be seen, shadow of mast and rigging against the sky, glimpses of water through the gray smoke of the hull, blobs of darkness that were the crewmen. Sound was still clear, he could hear the mutter of superstitious awe, the crack of the whip, and Imazu's oaths that sent the oars creaking and splashing again. Karun's hand was a misty blur before his eyes. 
Caresis was a shadow beside him. She laughed once more, a low, exultant throb, and pulled his lips down to hers. He ruffled the streaming, fragrant hair and felt a return of courage. It was only a spell. But what were the spells? He wondered for the thousandth time. He did not hold with the simple theory that wizards were in league with gods or demons. They had powers, yes, but he was sure that somehow these powers came only from within themselves. Caresis had always evaded his questions about it. There must be some simple answer to the problem, some real process, as real as that of making a fire behind the performances of the sorcerers, but it baffled him to think what it might be. Blast it all! It just wasn't reasonable that Shurzon, for instance, should have been able actually to change himself into a jungle monster many times his size. Yet he, Karun, had seen the thing, had felt its wet scales and smelled its reptile stink. How? The ship plowed slowly on. Now and then Karun looked at the compass, straining his eyes to discern the blurred needle. Otherwise they could only wait. But waiting with Caresis was remarkably pleasant. It was at the end of a timeless time, perhaps half a day, that he saw the Xanthian patrol. Look, he pointed, there they come. Caresis stared boldly over the sea. The hand beneath his was steady as her voice. So I see. They're beautiful, aren't they? The Cataria came leaping across the waves, big graceful beasts with the shapes of fish, their smooth black hides shining and the water white beneath their threshing tails. Astride each was a great golden form bearing a lance. They quartered across the horizon and were lost to sight. The crew mumbled in fear, shaken to their hardy souls by the terrible unhuman grace of the Xanthi. Imazu cursed them back to work. The ship went on. Islands slipped by, empty of man-sign. They had glimpses of Xanthi works, spires and walls rearing above the jungle. These were not the white colonnaded buildings of Tauros or the timbered halls of Konahor. Of black stone they were, with pointed towers climbing crazily skyward. Once a great sea serpent reared its head, spouted water, and writhed away. All creatures save man could sense the presence of wizardry and refused to go near it. Night fell, an abyss of night broken only by faint glimmerings of sea-fire under the carpeting weed. Men stood on easy watch in full armor, peering blindly into the somber immensity. It was hot, hot and silent. Near midnight, the lookout shouted from the masthead, Zanthi to larboard. Silence, you fool, called Imazu. Want them to hear us? The patrol was a faint swirl and streaking of phosphorescence, blacker shadows against the night. It was coming nearer. Have they spotted us? wondered Corun. No, breathed Caresis, but they're close enough for their mounts. There was a great snorting and splashing out in the murk. The Cateria were refusing to go into the circle of Shurzon's spell. Voices lifted, an unhuman croaking. The Irene, the only animal who did not seem to mind witchcraft, snarled in saw-edged tones, eyes a green blaze against the night. Presently the squad turned and slipped away. "'They know something is wrong, and they've gone for help,' said Karun. "'We'll have a fight on our hands before long.' He stretched his big body, suddenly eager for action. This waiting was more than he could stand. The ship drove on. Corun and Caresis napped on the deck. It was too stiflingly hot below. The long night wore away. In the misty gray of morning they saw a dark mass advancing from the west. Corun's sword rasped out of the sheath. It was a long, double-edged blade, such as they used in Konahor, and it was thirsty. "'Get inside, Caresis,' he said tightly. 
Get inside yourself, she answered. There was a lilt in her voice like a little girl's. He felt her quiver with joyous expectation. The ghostly outlines of the ship wavered, thickened, faded again, flickered back toward solidity. Suddenly they had sight. The vessel lay real around them. They saw each other in helm and corslet, face looking into taunted face. They have a wizard along. He broke Sharzan's spell, said the Karahorian. We looked for that, answered Caresis evenly. But as long as Sharzan keeps fighting him there will be a roiling of magic around us, such that none of their beasts will approach. She stood beside him, slim and boyish in polished cuirass and plumed helmet, short sword belted to her waist and a bow in her hand. Her nostrils quivered, her eyes shone, and she laughed aloud. We'll drive them off, she said. We'll send them home like beaten Iaganaths. Imazu blew the war horn, wild brazen echoes screaming over the sea. His men drew in the oars, pulled on their armor, and stood along the rails, waiting. But did we come here to fight them? asked Karun. No, said Caresis. But we've known all along that we'd have to give them a taste of our might before they'd talk to us. The Xanthian lancers were milling about, half a league away, as if in conference. Suddenly someone blew a harsh-toned horn, and Karun saw half the troop slide from the saddle into the water. So they'll swim at us, he muttered. The attack came from all sides, converging on the ship in a rush of foam. As the Xanthi neared, Karun saw their remembered lineaments and felt the old clutch of panic. They weren't human. With the fluked tail one of them had twice the length of a man. The webbed hind feet on which they walked ashore were held close to the body. The strangely human hands carried weapons. They swam half under water, the dorsal fins rising over. Their necks were long, with gills near the blunt snouted heads. Their grinning mouths showed gleaming fangs. The eyes were big, dark, alive with cold intelligence. They bore no armor, but scales the color of beaten gold covered back and sides and tail. They came in at furious speed, churning the sea behind them. Caresus's voice rose in a wild shriek. Piraeus! Piraeus! Kill! The Irene howled and unfolded his leather-webbed wings. Like a hurled spear he streaked through the air, rushed down on the nearest Xanthian like a thunderbolt, claws, teeth, barbed tail, a blinding fury of blood and death ripping flesh as if it were parchment. The ship's ballista chunked and balls of the ever-burning Archaean fire were hurled out to fall blazing among the enemy. Caresus's bow hummed beside Karun. A Xanthian went under with an arrow in his throat. The air was thick with shafts as the crew fired. Still the Xanthi rushed on, ducking up and down near impossible to hit. The first of them came up to the hull and sank their clawed fingers into the wood. The sailors thrust downward with pikes, howling in fear-maddened rage. The man near Karun went down with a hurled javelin through him. At once a huge golden form was slithering over the rail onto the deck. The sword in his hand flashed. Another Amlotuin's weapon was knocked spinning from his hand, and the reptile hewed him down. Karun sprang to do battle. The swords clashed together with a shock that jarred the man backward. Karun spread his feet and smote out. His blade whirled down to strike the shoulder, gash the chest, and drive the hissing monster back. With a rising cold fury Karun followed it up. That for the long inquisition! That for being a horror out of the sea-bottom! That for threatening Caresus! The Xanthian writhed with a belly ripped open. Still he wouldn't die. He flopped and struck from the deck. Karun evaded the sweeping tail and cut off the creature's head. They were pouring onto the ship through gaps in the line. 
Carissa stood on the foredeck in a line of defending men, her bow singing death. Battle snarled about the mast. Men against monsters, sword and halbert and axe belling the cloven bone. A giant's blow bowled Karun off his feet, the tail of Azanthian. He rolled over and thrust upward as the sea demon sprang on him. The sword went through the heart. Hissing and snapping, his foe toppled on him. He heaved the struggling body away and sprang back to his stance. "'To me!' bellowed Imazu. "'To me, men!' He stood wielding a huge battle-axe by the mast, striking at the beasts that raged around him, lopping heads and arms and tails like a woodman. The scattered humans rallied and began to fight their way toward him, step by bloody step. Piraeus the Irene was everywhere, a flying fury, ripping and biting and smashing with wing blows. Karun loomed huge over the men who fought beside him, the sword shrieking and thundering in his hands. Imazu stood stolidly against the mast, smashing at all comers. A rush of Xanthi broke past him and surged against the foredeck. The defenders beat them off. Caresis thrusting as savagely with her sword as any man, and they reeled back against the masthead warriors to be cut down. A Xanthian sprang at Karun, wielding a long shafted axe that shivered the sword in his hand. The Conahorian struck back, his blade darting past the monster's guard to stab through the throat. The Xanthian staggered. Karun wrenched the blade loose and brought it down again to sing in the reptile's skull. Before he could pull it loose, another was on him. Karun ducked under the spear he carried and closed his hands around the slippery sides. The clawed feet raked his legs. He lifted the thing and hurled it into another with bone-shattering force. One of them threshed wildly, neck broken, the other bounded at Karun. The man yanked his sword free, and it whistled against the golden head. Back and forth the struggle swayed, crashing of metal and howling of warriors, and the Xanthi were driven to the rails. They could not stand against the rallying human line in the narrow confines of the ship. "'Kill them!' roared Imazu. "'Kill the misbegotten snakes!' Suddenly the Xanthi were slipping overboard, swimming for their mounts beyond the zone of magic. Piraeus followed, harrying them, pulling them half out of the water to rip their throats out. The ship was wet, streaming with human red and reptile yellow blood. Dead and wounded littered the decks. Karun saw the Xanthi cavalry retreating out of sight. "'We've won!' he gasped. "'We've won!' "'No, wait!' Caresis inclined her head sharply, seeming to listen, then darted past him to open a hatch. Light streamed down into the hold. It was filling. The bilge was rising. I thought so, she said grimly. They're below us, chopping into the hull. We'll see about that, unbuckling his caress. All who can swim, after me. No, no, they'll kill you. Come on, rapped Imazu, letting his own breastplate clang to the deck. Karun sprang overboard. He was wearing nothing but a kilt now, and had a spear in one hand and a dirk in his teeth. Fear was gone, washed out by the red tides of battle. There was only a bleak, terrible triumph in him. Men had beaten the sea demons. Underwater it was green and dim. He swam down, down, brushing the hull, pulling himself along the length of the keel. There were half a dozen shapes clustered near the waist, working with axes. He pushed against the keel and darted at them, holding the spear like a lance. The keen point stabbed into the belly of one monster. The others turned, their eyes terrible in the gloom. Karun took the dirk in his hand, got a grip on the next nearest, and stabbed. Claws ripped his flank and back. His lungs were bursting. There was a roaring in his head and darkness before his eyes. He stabbed blindly, furiously. Suddenly the struggling form let go. Karun broke the surface and gasped in a lungful of air. A sea demon leaped up beside him. 
At once the Irene was on him. The Xanthian screamed as he was torn apart. Karun dove back under water. The other seamen were down there fighting for their lives. They outnumbered the Xanthi, but the monsters were in their native element. Blood streaked the water, blinding them all. It was a strange, horrible battle for survival. In the end, Karun and Imazu and the others, except for four, were hauled back aboard. "'We drove them off,' said the pirate wearily. "'Oh, my dear, my dearest dear!' Caresis, who had laughed in battle, was sobbing on his breast. Shirzong was on deck, looking over the scene. "'We did well,' he said. "'We stood them off, killed about thirty, and only lost fifteen men.' At that rate, said Karun, it won't take them long to clear our decks. I don't think they will try again, said Shurzon. He went over to a captured Xanthian. The sea demon had had a foot chopped off in the battle and been pinned to the deck by a pike, but he still lived and rasped defiance at them. If allowed to live, he would grow new members. The monsters were tougher than they had a right to be. Hark you, said Shurzon in the Xanthian tongue, which he had learned with astonishing ease. We come on a mission of peace, with an offer that your king will be pleased to hear. You have seen only a small part of our powers. It is not beyond us to sail to your palace and bring it crumbling to earth. Koran wondered how much was bluff. The old sorcerer might really be able to do it. In any case, he had nerve. "'What can you things offer us?' asked the Xanthian. "'That is only for the king to hear,' said Shurzon coldly. "'He will not thank you for molesting us. Now we will let you go to bear word back to your rulers. Tell them we are coming whether they will or no but that we come in friendship if they will but show it. After all, if they wish to kill us, it can be just as easily done, if at all, after they have heard us out. Now go." Imazu pulled the pike loose, and the yellow bleeding Xanthian writhed overboard. "'I do not think we will be bothered again,' said Shurzon calmly. Not before we get to the Black Palace. You may be right, admitted Koran. You gave them a good argument by their standards. Friends? muttered Imazu. Friends with those things? As soon expect the Irene to lie down by the bovin, I think. Come, said Caresis impatiently. We have to repair the leak and clean the decks and get under way again. It is a long trip yet to the Black Palace." She turned to Karun, and her eyes were dark flames. "'How you fought!' she whispered. "'How you fought, beloved!' End of Part 5 Part 6 The castle stood atop one of the high gray cliffs which walled in a little bay. Beyond the shore the island climbed steeply toward a gaunt mountain bare of jungle. The sea rolled sullenly against the rocks, under a low gloomy sky thickening with the approach of night. The Brisea rowed slowly into the bay, twenty men at the oars and the rest standing nervous guard by the rails. On either side the Xanthian cavalry hemmed them in, lancers astride the swimming cateras, Cateria, with eyes watchful on the humans, and behind them three great sea-snakes under direction of their sorcerers followed ominously. Amazu shivered. If they came at us now, he muttered, we wouldn't last long. We'd give them a fight, said Karun. They will receive us, declared Shurzon. The ship grounded at the shallows near the beach. The sailors hesitated. To pull her ashore would be to expose themselves almost helplessly to attack. "'Go on, jump to it,' snapped Imazu, and the men shipped their oars and sheathed their weapons, waded into the bay and dragged the vessel up on the strand. 
The chiefs of the Xanthi stood waiting for them. There were perhaps fifty of the reptiles, huge golden forms wrapped in dark flowing robes on which glittered ropes of jewels. A few wore tall mitres and carried hooked staffs of office. Like statues they stood, waiting, and the sailors shivered. Charzon, Caresis, Corun, and Imazu walked up toward them with all the slow dignity they could summon. The Conahorian's eyes sought the huge wrinkled form of Satu, king of the Xanthi. The monster's gaze brightened on him, and the fanged mouth opened in a bass croak. So you have returned to us. You may not leave this time. Your Majesty's hospitality overwhelms me, said Karun ironically. A stooped old Xanthian beside the king plucked his sleeve and hissed rapidly. I told you, sire, I told you he would come back with the ruin of worlds in his train. Cut them all down now before the fate strike. Kill them while there is time. There will be time, said Satu. His unblinking eyes locked with Shorzorn's, and suddenly the twilight shimmered and trembled. The nerves of men shook, and out in the water the sea beast snorted with panic. For a long moment that silent duel of wizardry quivered in the air, and then it faded, and the unreality receded into the background of dusk. Slowly the Xanthian monarch nodded as if satisfied to find an opponent he could not overcome. "'I am Sharzan of Akara,' said the man, "'and I would speak with the chiefs of the Xanthi.' "'You may do so,' replied the reptile. "'Come up to the castle, and we will quarter your folk.' At Imazu's order the sailors began unloading the gifts that had been brought. Weapons, vessels, and ornaments of precious metals set with jewels, rare tapestries, and incenses. Satu hardly glanced at them. "'Follow me,' he said curtly. "'All your people.' "'I'd hoped at least to leave a guard on the ship,' murmured Imazu to Corun. "'Would have done little good if they really wanted to seize her,' whispered the Conahorian. It did not seem as if Satu could have heard them, but he turned and his bass boomed, rolling over the mumbling surf. "'That is right. You may as well relax your petty precautions. They will avail nothing.' In a long file they went up a narrow trail toward the Black Palace. The Xanthian rulers went first, with deliberately paced dignity. Thereafter the human captives, their men, and a silent troop of armed reptile soldiery. Hemmed in, thought Corun grimly, if they want to start shooting. Caresis's hand clasped his, a warm grip in the misty gloom. He responded gratefully. She came right behind him, her other hand on the nervous and growling Irene. The castle loomed ahead, blacker than the night that was gathering, the gigantic walls climbing sheer toward the sky the spear-like towers half lost in the swirling fog. There was always fog here, Karun remembered, mist and rain and shadow. It was never full day on the island. He sniffed the dank sea smell that blew from the gaping portals and bristled in recollection. They entered the cavernous doorway and went down a high, narrow corridor which seemed to stretch on forever. Its bare stone walls were wet and green-slimed, tendrils of mist drifted under the invisibly high ceiling, and he heard the hooting and muttering of unknown voices somewhere in the murk. The only light was a dim bluish radiance from fungoid balls growing on the walls, a cold, unhealthy, shadowless illumination in which the white humans looked like drowned corpses. Looking behind, Corun could barely make out the frightened faces of the Umlotuans huddled close together and gripping their weapons with futile strength. The Xanthi glided noiselessly through the mumbling gloom, tall spectral forms with faint golden light streaming from their damp scales. It seemed as if there were other presences in the castle, too, things flitting just beyond sight 
hiding in lightless corners and fluttering between the streamers of fog. Always, it seemed, there were watching eyes, watching and waiting in the dark. They came into a cavernous antechamber whose walls were lost in the dripping twilight. Satthu's voice boomed hollowly between the chill immensities of it. Follow those who will show you to your quarters. Silent Xanthi slipped between the human ranks, herding them with spears, the sailors one way, their chiefs another. Where are you taking the men? asked Imazu with an anger sharpened by fear. Where are you keeping them? The echoes flew from wall to wall, jeering him, keeping them, keeping them, them, them. They go below the castle, said a Xanthian. You will have more suitable rooms. Our men down in the old dungeons. Karun's hand whitened on the hilt of his sword, but it was useless to protest unless they wanted to start a battle now. The four human leaders were taken down another whispering, echoing tunnel of a corridor, up a long ramp that seemed to wind inside one of the towers, and into a circular room in whose walls were six doors. There the guards left them, fading back down the impenetrable night of the ramp. The rooms were furnished with grotesque ornateness, huge, hideously carved beds and tables, scaled tapestries and rugs, shells and jewels set in the mold-covered walls. Narrow slits of windows opened on the wet night. Darkness and mist hid Karun's view of the ground, but the faintness of the surf told him they must be dizzyingly high up. "'Ill is this,' he said. A few guards on that ramp can bottle us up here forever, and they need only lock the dungeon gates to have our men imprisoned below. We will treat with them. Before long they will be our allies, said Shorzon. His hooded eyes were on Caresis. It was with a sudden shock that Karun remembered. Days and nights of bliss, and then the violence of battle and the tension of approach, had driven from his mind the fact that he had never been told what the witch pair were really here for. It was their voyage, not his. And what real good could have brought them to this place of evil? He shoved his big body forward, a tawny giant in the foggy chill of the central room. "'It is near time I was told something of what you intend,' he said. "'I have guided you and taught you and battled at your side. I'll not be kept blindfolded any longer. You will be told what I tell you, no more, said Shorzon haughtily. You have me to thank for your miserable life. Let that be enough. You can thank me that you're not being eaten by fish at the bottom of the sea right now, snapped Karun. By Bronog Bonner, I've had enough of this. He stood with his back against the wall, sweeping them with his ice-blue eyes. Shorzon stood black and ominous, wrath in the smoldering sunken eyes. Caresis shrank back a little from both of them, but Piraeus, the Irene, growled and flattened his belly to the floor and stared greenly at Corun. Imazu shifted from foot to foot, his wide blue face twisted with indecision. "'I can strike you dead where you stand,' warned Shorzon. I can become a monster that will rip you to rags. Try it, snarled Corun. Just try it. Caresa slipped between them, and the huge dark eyes were bright with tears. Are we not in enough danger now, four humans against a land of walking beasts, without falling at each other's throats? I think it is the witchcraft of Sathu working on us, dividing us. Fight him. She swayed against the Conahorian. Karun, she breathed. Karun, my dearest of all, you shall know. You shall be told everything as soon as we dare. But don't you see? You haven't the skill to protect yourself and your knowledge against the Xanthian magic. Or against your magic, beloved. She laughed softly and drew him after her into one of the rooms. Come, Karun. We are all weary now. It is time to rest. Come, my dear. Tomorrow. 
End of Part 6 Part 7 Day crept past in the blindness of rain. Twice Xanthians brought them food, and once Karun and Imazu ventured down the ramp to find their way barred by spear-bearing reptiles. For the rest they were alone. It ate at the nerves like an acid. Charzon sat stiff, unmoving on a couch, eyes clouded with thought. His giant body could have been that of a Cahemrian mummy. Imazu squatted unhappily, carving one of the intricate trinkets with whose making sailors pass dreamy hours. Karun paced like a caged beast, throttled rage mounting in him. Even Perius grew restless and took to padding up and down the antechamber, passing Karun on the way. The man could not help a half-smile. He was growing almost fond of the irony and his honest malevolence after the intriguing of humans and Xanthi. Only Caresis remained calm. She lay curled on her bed like a big, beautiful animal, the long silken hair tumbling darkly past her shoulders, a veiled smile on her red lips. And so the day wore on. It was toward evening that they heard slow footfalls and looked out to see a party of Xanthi coming up the ramp. It was an awesome sight. The huge golden forms moving with deliberation and pride under the shimmering robes that flowed about them. Some were warriors, with saw-edged pikes flashing in their hands. But the one who spoke was plainly a palace official. Greeting from Satu, king of the Demon Sea, to Sharzan of Akera, the vice boomed. You are to feast with the lords of the Xanthi tonight. I am honored, bowed the sorcerer. The woman Caresis will come with me, for she is equal with me. That is permitted, said the Xanthian gravely. And we, I suppose, wait here, muttered Karun rebelliously. It won't be for long, smiled Caresis softly. After tonight, I think it will be safe to tell you what you wish to know. She had donned banqueting dress carried up with her from the ship a clinging robe of the light rippling silk of Hyung Nu, a scarlet cloak that was like a rush of flame from her slim bare shoulders, barbarically massive bracelets and necklaces, a single fire ruby burning at her white throat. Pearls and silver glittered like dewdrops in her night-black hair. The loveliness of her caught at Karun's throat. He could only stare with dumb longing as she went after Sharzan and the Xanthi. She turned to wave at him. Her whisper twined around his heart. Good night, beloved. When they were gone, the Irene padding after them, Imazu gave Karun a rueful look and said, So now we are out of the story. Not yet, answered the Konohorian, still a little dazed. Oh, yes, oh, yes. Surely you do not think that we plain sailormen will be asked for our opinions? No, Karun, we are only pieces on Shurzon's board. We've done our part, and now he will put us back in the box. Carissa said, Amazo shook his scarred bald head sadly, Surely you don't believe a word that black witch utters. Karun half drew his sword. I told you before that I'd hear no word against Carissa, he said thinly. As you will. It doesn't matter anyway. But be honest, Karun. Strike me down if you will. It doesn't matter now. But try to think. I've known Caresis longer than you, and I've never known anyone to change their habits overnight. For anyone. She said, Oh, I think she likes you in her own way. You make as handsome and useful a pet as that Dirini of hers. But whatever else she is after, it is something for which she would give more than the world and not have a second thought about it. Karun paced unhappily. I don't trust Shurzon, he admitted. I trust him as I would a mad Verax. And anything Satu plans is evil. He glared down the cavernous mouth of the ramp. If I can only hear what they say. What chance of that? We're under guard, you know. Aye, so, but... Struck with a sudden thought, Karun went over to the window. 
The rain has ceased outside, but a solid wall of fog and night barred vision. It was breathlessly hot, and he heard the low muttering of thunder in the hidden sky. There were vines growing on the wall, tendrils as thick as a man's leg. The broad leaves hung down over the sill, wet with rain and fog. "'I remember the layout of the castle,' he said slowly. "'It's a warren of tunnels and corridors, but I could find my way to the feasting hall.' "'If they caught you it would be death,' said Imazu uneasily. Corun's grin was bleak. It will most likely be death anyway, he said. I think I'll try. I'm not as spry as I once was, but— No, no, Imazu, you had best wait here. Then if anyone comes prying and sees you, he'll think we're both here. Maybe. Corun slipped off tunic and sandals, leaving only his kilt. He swung his sword across his back, put a knife in his belt, and turned toward the window. It may be all wrong, he said. I should trust Caresis, and I do, Imazu, but they might easily overpower her, and anything is better than this waiting like beasts in a trap. The gods be with you, then, said Imazu huskily. He shook a horny fist. To hell with Sharzarm. I've been his thrall too long. I'm with you, friend. Thanks. Karun swung out the window. Good luck to both. To all of us, Imazu. The fog wrapped around his eyes like a hood. He could barely see the shadowy wall, and he groped with fingers and toes for the vines. One slip, one break, and he would be spattered to red ruin in the courtyard below. Down and down and down. Twigs clawed at him. The branches were slick in his hands, buried under a smother of leaves. His muscles began to ache with the strain. Several times he slipped and saved himself with a desperate clawing grip. Something moaned in the night under the deepening growl of thunder. He clung to the wall and strained his eyes down. A breath of wind parted the fog briefly into ragged streamers, through which winked the savage light of a bolt of lightning, high in the murky sky. Down below was the courtyard. He saw the metallic gleam of scales, guards pacing the walls. Slowly he edged his way across the outjutting tower to the main wall of the castle. Slantwise he crept over its surface until a slit of blackness loomed before him, another window. He had to squeeze to get through, the stone scraping his skin. For a moment he stood inside, breathing heavily, the drawn sword in his hand. There was a corridor stretching beyond this room, on into the darkness lit by the ghostly blue fungus glow. He saw and heard nothing of the Xanthi, but something scuttled across the floor and crouched in a shadowed corner, watching him. On noiseless bare feet he ran down the hall. Fog eddied and curled in the tenebrous length of it. He heard the dripping of water and once a shuddering scream ripped the dank air. He thought he remembered where he was in that labyrinth. Uh, left here, and there would be another ramp going down. A huge golden form loomed around the corner. Before the jaws could open to shout, Karun's sword hissed in a vicious arc, and the Xanthian's head leaped from his shoulders. He kicked the flopping body behind a door and sped on his way, panting. Halfway down the ramp a narrow entrance gaped one of the tunnels that riddled the building through its massive walls. Karun slithered down its lightless wet length. It should open on the great chamber and, black against the dim blue light of the exit, a motionless form was squatting. Karun groaned inwardly. They had a guard against intruders then. Best to go back now. No. He snarled soundlessly and bounded forward, clutching the sword in one hand and reaching out with the other. Fingers rasping across the scaly hide, he hooked the thing's neck into the crook of his elbow and yanked the heavy body back into the tunnel with one enormous wrench. 
Blind in the darkness, he stabbed into the mouth, driving the point of his sword through flesh and bone into the brain. The dying monster's claws raked him as he crouched over the body. He reflected grimly that, no matter how benevolent the Xanthi might be, he would die for murder if they ever caught him. But he had no great fear of their suddenly becoming tender toward mankind. The bulk of the reptile race was peaceable, actually, but their rulers were relentless. The tunnel opened on a small balcony halfway up the rearing chamber wall. Corun lay on his belly, peering down over the edge. They sat at a long table, the lords of the demon sea, and he felt a dim surprise at seeing that they were almost through eating. Had his nightmare journey taken that long? They were talking, and the sound drifted up to his ears. At the head of the table, Satthu and his counselors sat on a long, ornate couch ablaze with beaten gold. Shorzon and Caresis were reclining nearby, sipping the bitter yellow wine of the Xanthi. It was strange to hear the hideous hissing and croaking of the reptile language coming from Caresis's lovely throat. "'Interesting, I am sure,' said the king. "'More than that, more than that!' It seemed to Karun that he could almost see the terrible fire in Shurzon's eyes. The wizard leaned forward, shaking with intensity. "'You can do it. The Xanthi can conquer Akera with ease. Your sea cavalry and serpents can smash their ships. Your devil powder can burst their walls into the air. Your legions can overrun their land. Your wizardry blind and craze them and the terror you will inspire will force the people to do our bidding." "'Possibly you overrate us,' said Satthu. "'It is true that we have great numbers and a strong army. But do not forget that the Xanthi are actually a more peaceful race than man. Your kind is hard and savage, murdering even each other making war simply for loot or glory or no reason at all. Until the king race arose, the Xanthi dwelt quietly on the sea-bottom and a few small islands without wish to harm anyone. They have not even the natural capacity for magic possessed, however undeveloped, by all humans. As a result, they are much more susceptible to it than men. Thus, when the king race was born with such powers, they were soon able to control all their people and make themselves the absolute masters of the Xanthi. But we, kings and wizards and lords of the demon sea, are all one interbred clan. Without us, the Xanthi power would collapse. They would go back to what they were. Even Xanthi science is all of our making. We, the king race, developed the devil powder, and all that we have ever made is stored in the dungeons of this very building, enough to blow it into the sky." Satsu made a grimace which might have been a sardonic smile. "'Do not read weakness into that admission,' he said. Even though all the lords who make Xanthi and might are gathered in this one room, that power is still immeasurably greater than you can imagine. To show you how helpless you are, your men are locked into the dungeons, and your ingish has been lifted from their minds." "'Impossible!' gasped Shurzon. "'A ingish cannot be lifted. But it can. What is it but a compulsion implanted in the brain, so deeply as to supersede all other habits? One mind cannot erase that imposed pattern, but several minds working in concert can do so, and that I and my counselors have done. As of today your folk are free in soul hating you for what you made them. You are alone." The great scaled forms edged closer, menacingly. 
Caron's fist clenched around his sword. If they harmed Caresis. But she said coolly, It does not matter. Our men were simply to bring us here, nothing else. We can dispense with them. What matters is our plan to impose magic control over Akera. And I cannot yet see what benefit the Xanthi would get of it, said Xanthu impatiently. Our powers of darkness are so much greater than yours already that— Let us not use words meant to impress the ignorant minds among ourselves, said Caresis scornfully. Every sorcerer knows there is nothing of heaven or earth about magic. It is but the imposition of a pattern on other minds. It creates, by control of the senses, illusions of lycanthropy or whatever else is desired, or it binds the subject by unbreakable compulsion of a engish. But it is no more than that, one mind reaching through space to create what impressions it wills on another mind. Your devil powder, or an ordinary sword, or axe, or fist, is more dangerous, if the fools only knew." Koran's breath hissed between his teeth. If, if that, oh, gods, if that was the secret of the magicians! As you will, said Satsu indifferently. What matters is that there are more of our minds than your two and thus we can beat down any attempt you may make against us. So it comes back to the question. Why should we help you seize and hold Akara? What will we gain?" "'I should say nothing of its great wealth,' said Shorzan. "'But it is true, as you say, that many minds working together are immeasurably more powerful than one, more powerful even than the sum of all those minds working separately. I have worked with as many as a dozen slaves, having them concentrate with me so that I could draw their mind force through my own brain and use it as my own, and the results have amazed me. Now if the entire population of Akera were forced to help us all at one time." The Xanthi's eyes glittered, and a low murmur rose among them. Shorzon went on rapidly. It would be a power over the world. Nothing could stand before that massed mental force. With us skilled sorcerers to direct, and the soldiers of Xanthi to compel obedience, we could lay an engish on whole nations without even having to be near them. We could span immeasurable gulfs of space and contact minds on those other worlds which philosophers think exist beyond the upper clouds. We could, by thus heightening our own mental powers, think out the very problems of existence, find the deepest secrets of nature forces beside which your devil powder would be a spark. Drawing life energy from other bodies, we would never grow old. We would live forever. Satsu, lords of Xanthi, I offer you a chance to become gods." The stillness was broken only by the muttering and whispering of the Xanthi among themselves. Mist drifted through the raw, wet night of the hall. The walls seemed to waver, shift, and blur like smoke. "'Why could we not do this in our own nation?' asked the Satthu. "'Because, as you yourself said, the Xanthi do not have the latent mental powers of humans, save for you few who are the masters. It must be mankind who is controlled, with the commoners of your race as overseers. And why could we not kill you and do this ourselves? Because you do not understand humans. The differences are too great. You could never control human thoughts as Garesis or I could. Another Xanthian spoke. But do you not realize what this will do to the human race? Your occurrence will become mindless machines under such control. Drained of life energy, they will age and die like animals. 
I doubt that any will live ten seasons. What of that? shrugged Caresis. There are other nations nearby to draw on. Conahor, Nariki, Krimri, ultimately the world. We will have centuries, remember. We will never die. And you do not care for your own race at all? It will no longer be our race, said Shurzan. We will be gods, thinking and living and wielding such powers as they, as we ourselves right now, could never dream. Why, do what you will with our men here to start. What does it matter? But do not harm the yellow-haired man from Conahor, said Caresis sharply. He's mine forever. Satu sat thinking like the statue of a Crimean beast-god cast in shining gold. Slowly at last he nodded, and an eerie sigh ran down the long table as the lords of the Xanthi hissed agreement. "'It will be done,' said Zatu. Corin stumbled back down the tunnel, reckless of discovery, blind and deaf with madness that roared in his skull. Caresis, Caresis, Caresis! It was not the horror of the scheme, the ruin that it would bring even if it failed, the revelation of how immeasurably powerful would the forces lead against man. He could have stood that, and braced himself to fight it as long as there was breath in his lungs. But Caresis! She had been a part of it. She had helped plan it, had coldly condemned her whole race to oblivion. She had lied to him, cheated him, betrayed him, used him, and now she wanted him for a toy, an immortal puppet. Witch! 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 Less human than the Irene at her feet, than the Xanthi themselves. Mad with a cold madness such as he had never thought could be. Caresis, 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 I loved you with all my heart, I loved you. There was no hope in him, no longing for anything but the fullest revenge he could take before they hewed him to the ground. Had the old Xanthian wizard foretold he would bring death? Aye, by the mad, cruel gods who ruled men's destinies, he would. He reached the corridor and began to run. End of Part 7 Part 8 Down a long curving ramp that led into a pit of blackness. The dungeons could not be far. They lay this way. He hugged himself into the shadows as a troop of guards went by. They were talking in their hoarse, croaking language, and did not peer into the corners of the labyrinth. When they were past, Karun sped on his way. The stone walls became rough, damp tunnels, hewed out of the living rock under the castle. He groped through a blackness relieved only by the occasional dull glow of fungi. The darkness hissed and rustled with movements. He caught the glimmer of three red eyes watching, and something slithered over his bare feet. A far, faint scream quivered down the hollow length of passages. It had shaken him when he was here before, but now. What mattered? What was important save to kill as many of the monsters as he could before they overwhelmed him? The tunnel opened on a great cave, whose floor was a pool of oily black water. As he skirted its rim along a narrow, slippery edge, something stirred, a misshapen giant thing darker than the night. It roared hollowly and swam toward him. A wave of foul odor came with it, catching Karun's throat in a sick dizziness. He swayed on the edge of the pool and the swimmer began to crawl out of it toward him. Karun saw its teeth gleam wetly in the vague blue light. But there were no eyes. It was blind. He retreated along the ledge toward the farther exit. The ground trembled under the bulk of the creature. Its jaws clashed shut behind him as he leaped free. Racing down the tunnel he heard the bellowing of it like dull thunder through the reeking gloom. It wouldn't follow far, but that way of return would be barred to him. 
No matter, no matter. He burst into another open space. It was lit by a dim flickering fire over which crouched three armed Zanthi. Beyond, the red light glimmered on an iron-barred doorway, and behind that there were figures stirring. Men. Karun bounded across the floor, the sword shrieking in his hand. It whirled down to crash through the skull bones of one guard. Before he could free it, the other two were on him. He ducked a murderous pike thrust and slipped close to the wielder, stabbing upward with his dagger. The Xanthian screamed and hugged Karun close to himself, fastening his jaws in the man's shoulder. Karun slashed wildly, ripping open the throat. They tumbled to the ground, locked in each other's arms, raging like beasts. Karun's knife glanced off the Xanthian's ribs, and he felt the steel snap over. He got both hands into the clamped jaws, heedless of the fangs, and wrenched. The jawbone cracked as he forced the reptile's mouth open. He rolled from beneath the still feebly struggling creature and glared round for the third. That one lay in a hacked ruin against the cell. He had backed up too close to the bars, and the men inside still had their weapons. Gasping, Karan climbed to his feet. An eager baying of fierce voices rolled out of the cell. Men gripped the bars and howled in maddened glee. Karan! Captain Karan, get us out of here! Let us out to rip Sharzan's guts loose! Arr! The Kaunahorian lunch lurched over to a dead Xanthian, at whose waist hung a bundle of keys. His hands shook as he tried them in the lock. When he got the door open, the men were out in a single tide. He leaned heavily on an Omlotuan's arm. "'What happened to you?' he asked. "'The devils let us down here and then closed the door on us,' snarled the blue man. Later a group of them in rich dress came down, and suddenly we saw what a slavery we'd been in to Shorzon. Suddenly it no longer seemed that obedience to him was the only possible thing. Omwanzi, let me at his throat. You may have that chance, said the pirate. He felt strength returning. He stood erect and faced them in the flickering firelight. Their eyes gleamed back at him out of the shadows, fierce as the metal of their weapons. Listen, he said. We might be able to fight our way out of here, but we'd never escape across the demon sea. But I know a way to destroy this whole cursed house and every being in it, if you'll follow me." "'Aye!' the shout filled the cavern with savage thunder. They shook their weapons in the air, gleam of red-lit steel out of the trembling darkness. "'Aye!' Karun picked up his sword and trotted down the nearest passageway. He was bleeding, he saw vaguely but he felt little pain from it. He was beyond that now. The thing was to find the devil powder. Satthu had said it was somewhere down here. They went along, tunnel after winding tunnel, losing all sense of direction in the wet, hollow dark. Karun had a sudden nightmare feeling that they might wander down here forever, blundering from cave to empty cave while eternity grayed. "'Where are we going?' asked someone impatiently. "'Where are Xanthi to fight?' "'I don't know,' snapped Karun. They came suddenly into another broad cavern, beyond which was another barred door. Four Xanthi stood guard in front of it. They never had a chance. The air was suddenly full of hurled weapons, and they were buried under a pile of edged steel. Karun searched the bodies, but found no keys. In the murk beyond he could dimly see boxes and barrels reaching into fathomless distances, but the door was held fast. Of course, Satsu would never trust his men-at-arms with entrance to the devil powder. The corsair snarled and grabbed a bar with both hands. "'Pull, men of Umlotu!' he shouted. "'Pull!' They swarmed close, thirty-odd big blue men with the strength of hate in them. Clutching the cell bars, grabbing each other's waists, heaving with a force that shrieked through the iron, pull! The lock burst, and they staggered back as the door swung wide. 
Instantly Coron was inside, ripping open a box and laughing aloud to see the black grains that filled it. For a wild moment he thought of plunging a brand into the powder and going up in flame and thunder with the castle. Coldness returned. He checked himself and looked around for fuses. His followers would not have permitted him to commit a suicide that involved them, and after all, the longer he lived, the more enemies he'd have a chance to cut down personally. "'I've heard talk of this stuff,' said one of the men nervously. "'Is it true that setting fire to it releases a demon?' "'Aye!' Corrin found the long rope-like fuses coiled in a box. He knotted several together and put one end into the powder. The ignition of one container would quickly set off the rest, and the cavern was huge, filled with many shiploads of sleeping hell. "'If we can fight our way to the ship and get clear before the fire reaches the powder,' began the Umlotuan. "'We can try that, I suppose,' said Corrin. He estimated the burning time of his fuse from memories of the use he'd seen the Xanthi make of the devil powder. Yes, there would be a fair allowance for escape, though he doubted that they would ever reach the strand alive. He touched a stick of fire to the end of the fuse. It began to sputter, a red spark creeping along it toward the open box. "'Let's go!' shouted Corun. They pounded along the tunnel, heedless of direction. There should be an upward-leading ramp somewhere. Ah, there it was. Up its length they raced, past levels of the dungeons, toward the main floor of the castle. At the end there was a brighter blue light than they had seen below. Up, up, up and out. The chamber was enormous, a pillared immensity reaching to a ceiling hidden in sheer height, Rugs and tapestries of the scaled Xanthian weave were strewn about, and their heavy, intricately carved furniture filled it. At the far end stood a towering, canopied throne, on which sat a huge golden farm. Other shapes stood around it, and there were pikemen lining the walls at rigid attention. Through the haze of mist and twilight, Corun saw the black robe of Charzon and the flame-colored cloak of Caresis. He shrieked an oath and plunged for them. A horn screamed and the guards sprang from the walls to form a line before the throne. The humans shocked against the Xanthi with a fury that clamored through the building. Swords and axes began to fly. Corun hewed at the nearest grinning reptile face felt the sword sink in and roared the war cry of Conahor. He spitted the monster on his blade, lifted it, and pitchforked it into the ranks of the guards. Satsu bellowed and rose to meet him. Suddenly the Xanthian king was not there. It was a tentacled thing from the sea-bottom that filled the room, a thing whose bloated, dark body reared to the ceiling. Someone screamed. Fear locked the battlers into motionlessness. Magic! It was a sneering rattle in Corun's throat. He sprang into the very body of the sea creature. He felt the shock of striking its solid form, the rasp of its hide against him, the overwhelming poisonous stench of it. One tentacle closed around him. He felt his ribs snapping and the air popping from his burst lungs. It wasn't real. His mind gasped through the whirling agony. It wasn't real. He plowed grimly ahead, blind in the illusion that swirled around him, striking, striking. Dimly, through the roaring of his nerves, he felt his blade hit something solid. He bellowed in savage glee and smote again, again, and again. The smashing pressure lifted. He sobbed air into himself and looked with streaming eyes as a giant form dissolved into smoke, into mist, into empty air. It was Satsu writhing in pain at his feet, Satsu with his head nearly chopped off. It was only another dying Xanthian. Karun leaped up onto the throne and looked over the room. The guards and the sailors were still standing in shaken silence. 
Kill them, roared the pilot. Strike them down. Battle closed again with a snarl and a clang of steel. Karan glared around after another Xanthu of the sorcerer breed. There were none in sight. They must prudently have fled into another part of the castle. Well, let them. But other Xanthi were swarming into the chamber. Battle horns were hooting and the guttural reptile voices crying a summons. If the humans were not to be broken by sheer numbers, they'd have to fight their way out soon. And down in the dungeons a single red spark was eating its way toward a box of black powder. Karun jumped down again to the floor. His sword leaped sideways, cut his Anthean spine across, bit the tail from another. To me, he bawled, over here, men of Umlotu. The blues heard him and rallied, gathering into compact knots that slashed their way toward where his dripping sword whined and thundered. He never stopped striking. He drove the reptiles before him until they edged away from his advance. The men formed into one group, and Karun led it across the floor in a dash for the looming doorway. A red thought flashed across his brain. Where were Shurzon and Caresis? The Xanthi scattered before the desperate human rush. The men came out into a remembered hallway. It led to the outside, Karun recalled. By Bersaic Branner, they might escape yet. Karan! Karan, you sea devil, I knew it was your doing. The Konohorian turned to see Imazu bounding toward him with a bloody axe in one hand. Imazu, thank all the gods, Imazu was free. I, I heard a noise of fighting, and the tower guards went off toward it, gasped the Imlotuan captain. So I came to. On the way I met Shurzon and Caresis. What of them? breathed Karan. The blue warrior smiled savagely and flung a red thing down at Karun's feet. There, Shurzon's scheming head. My woman is free. Caresis? Imazu leaned on his axe, panting. She launched her arani at me. I ducked into a room and slammed the door in his face, then came here through another entrance. Caresis was loose. We've got to get clear said Karun. The devil powder was going to go off any time now. The Xanthi were rallying. They came at the humans in another rush. Karun and Imazu and their best men filled the corridor with a haze of steel, backing down toward the outer portal. It was a crazy blur of struggle, hewing at faces that wavered out of night, slapping down thrusts and reaching for the life of the enemy. Men fell, others took their places in the line. Down the corridor they retreated, fighting to get free. They left the trail of dead. The end of the passage loomed ahead, and the monstrous iron door was swinging shut. Caresis stood in the entrance. A wild storm wind outside sent her cloak flapping about her, red wings beating in the lightning shot darkness about the devil's rage of the goddess face. "'Stay here!' she screamed. "'Stay here and be cut down, you triple traitor!' The nearest Umlotuan sprang at her. The door clashed shut in his face. They heard the great bolt slam down outside. They were boxed in the end of the hall, and the Xanthi need only shoot them down with arrows. Down in the dungeons the fuse burned to its end, a sheet of flame sprang up in the open box of powder, reaching for the stacks around it. End of Part 8 Part 9 The first explosion came as a muffled roar. Corun felt the floor tremble underneath his feet. Men and Xanthi stood motionless, looking at each other with widening eyes, in which a common doom arose. So it ended. Sharzan and Satsu and their wizard cohorts would be gone. But Caresis, mad, lovely Caresis was loose, and the gods knew what hell she could brew among the leaderless Xanthi. The walls groaned as another boom echoed down their length. Well, death came to every man, and he had not done so badly. Karan began to realize how weary he was. 
He was bleeding from wounds and breath was raw in his lungs. The Umlotuans hammered on the door in panic, but the twenty or fewer survivors could never break it down. The devil powder roared, the floor heaved sickeningly under Corun's feet. He heard the crash of collapsing masonry. Wait, wait, one chance, one chance by the gods. Be ready to run out when the walls topple, he shouted. We'll have a little time. The Xanthi were fleeing in terror. The humans stood alone, waiting while the explosions rolled and banged around them. Cracks zigzagged across the walls. Dust choked the dank air. Crash! Karun saw the nearer wall swaying, toppling. The floor lifted and buckled, and he fell to the lurching ground. All the world was an insanity of racket and ruin. The lintel caved in, the portal sagged. Karun leaped for the opening like a pouncing Irene. The men swarmed with it out through the widening hole while the roof came down behind them. Someone screamed, a faint lost sound in the grinding fury of sundering stone. Rocks were flying. Karun saw one of them crack a man's head like a melon. Wildly he ran as the outer façade came down. There was a madness of storm outside, wind screaming to fill the sky, driving solid sheets of rain and hail before it. The incessant blinding lightning glared in a cold, shadowless brilliance. The brawling thunder drowned the roar of exploding devil powder. They fought out through the courtyard past the deserted outer gate. There came a blast which seemed to crack the sky. Karun was knocked down as by a giant's fist. He lay in the mud and saw a pillar of flame lift toward the heavens with the castle fountaining up on its wings. Thunder roared over the earth, shouting to the storm that raged in the heavens. Karun picked himself up and leaned dizzily against a tree stripped clean by the blast. Rain slanted across the ground, churning the mud beneath his feet the livid lightning glare blazing above. Vaguely, through ringing, deafened ears, he heard the wild clamor of the sea. Looking down the cataract which the upward trail had become, he saw the Brasea rocking in the wind where she lay on the beach. He gestured to Imazu, who staggered up to join him. His voice was barely audible over the shouting wind. "'Take the men down there!' We can't sail in this storm, but make the ship fast, stand guard over her. If I'm not back when the storm is done, start for home." "'Where are you going?' cried the Umlotuan. "'I'll be back, maybe. Stay with the ship.' Karun turned and slogged across the ground toward the jungle. Weariness was gone. He was like a machine running without thought or pain until it burned out. Caresus would have fled toward the high ground, he thought dully. Behind him Imazu started forward, then checked himself. Something of the ultimate loneliness that was in Karun must have come to the Umlotuan. It was not a mission on which any other man might go. And they had to save the ship. He gestured to his few remaining men, and they began the slow climb down to the beach. The castle was a heap of shattered rock, still moving convulsively as the last few boxes of devil powder exploded. The rain boiled down over it, churning through the fragments. Lightning flamed in the berserk heavens. Karun pushed through underbrush that clutched at his feet and clawed at his skin. The sword was still hanging loosely in one hand, nicked and blunted with battle. He went on mechanically, scarcely noticing the wind-whipped trees that barred his way. It came to him that he was fighting for Cromon, the Thalassocrat of Akera, ruler by right of conquest over Conahor. But there are worse things than foreign rule, if it was human, and one of the greater evils had fled toward the mountain. Presently he came out on the bare rocks above the fringe of jungle growth. The rain hammered at him, driven by a wind that screamed like a maddened beast. 
thunder boomed and rolled overhead, a roar of doom answering the thud of his heart. The water rushed over his ankles, foaming down toward the sea. She stood, waiting for him, atop a high, bare hill. Her cloak was drawn tightly about her slender body, but the wind caught at it, whipped and tore it. Her rain-wet hair blew wild. Karan! she called under the gale. Karan! I am coming, he said, not caring if she heard him or not. He struggled up to where she stood, limbed against the sheeted fire in heaven. They faced each other while the storm raged around them. Karan! She read death in his eyes as he lifted the sword. Her form blurred, the outlines of a monster grew in his eyes. He laughed bitterly. Ha! I know what your magic is, he said. You saw me kill Satsu. She was human again, human and lovely, a light-footed spirit of the hurricane. Her face was etched white in the lightning glare. Piraeus! she screamed. The Irene crept forth, belly to the ground, tail lashing. Hell glared out of the ice-green eyes. Karun braced himself, sword in hand. Piraeus sprang, not straight at the man, but into the air. His wings caught the wind, whirling him aloft. Twisting in mid-flight, he arrowed down. Karun struck at him. The Irene dodged the blow, and one buffeting wingtip caught the man's wrist. The sword fell from Karun's hand. At once the Irene was on him. Karun fell under that smashing attack. The Irene's fangs gleamed above his throat. The claws sank into his muscles. He flung up an arm, and the teeth crunched on it, grinding at the bone. Karun wrapped his legs in a scissor-lock around the gaunt body, pressing himself too close for the clawed hind feet to disembowel him. His free hand reached out, gouging. He felt an eyeball tear loose, and the Irene opened his mouth in a thin scream. Karun pulled his torn arm free. He struck with a bald fist at the devil-beast and felt his knuckles break under the impact. But bone snapped. Piraeus's jaw hung suddenly loose. The Irene sprang back, and Karun lurched to hands and feet. Piraeus edged closer, stiff-legged. Karun stumbled erect, and Piraeus charged. One great wing smashed out, brought the man toppling back to earth. Piraeus leaped for his exposed belly. Karun lashed out with both feet. The thud was dull and hollow under the racketing thunder. Piraeus tumbled back, and Karun sprang on him. The barbed tail slashed, laying Karun's thigh open. He fell atop the struggling beast and got his free hand on the throat. The mighty wings threshed, half-lifting the man and Irene. Karun pulled himself over on the writhing back. He locked legs around the body, arms around the neck, and heaved. The Irene yowled. His wings clashed together with skull-cracking force, barely missing the head of the man who hugged his back. His tail raked against Karun's back, seeking the vitals. Karun gave another yank. He felt the supple spine bending. Heave! Piraeus lifted a brassy scream. The strange dry sound of snapping vertebrae crackled out. Karun rolled away from the threshing form. Piraeus gasped, lifted his broken head, and looked with filming green eyes at Caresis, where she stood unmoving against the white fire of the sky. Slowly, painfully, he dragged himself toward her. Breath rattled in and out of his blood-filled lungs. Piraeus! Caresis bent over to touch the great head. The Irene sighed. His rough tongue licked her feet. Then he shuddered and lay still. Piraeus! Karun climbed to his feet and stood shaking. There was no strength left in him. It was running out through the dozen yawning wounds. 
The ground whirled and tilted crazily about him. He saw her standing against the sky, and slowly, slowly, he came toward her. Caresis picked up a stone and threw it. It seemed to take an immense time arcing toward him. Some dim corner of his buckling consciousness realized that it would knock him out, that she could then kill him with the sword and escape into the hills. It didn't matter. Nothing mattered. The stone crashed against his skull, and the world exploded into darkness. End of Part 9 Part 10 He woke up, slowly and painfully, and lay for a long time in a state of half-awareness, remembering only confused fragments of battle and despair. When he opened his eyes he saw that the storm was dying. Lightning was wan in the sky, and thunder mumbled farewell. The wind had fallen. The rain fell slow and heavy down on him. He saw her bending over him. The long wet hair tumbled past her face to fall on his breast. He was wrapped in her cloak, and she had ripped bandages from her robe for his hurts. He tried to move and could only stir feebly. She laid a hand on his cheek. Don't, she whispered. Just lie there, Corun. His head was on her lap, he realized dimly. His eyes questioned her. She laughed softly under the falling rain. <laughs> Don't you see? she said. Didn't you think of it? Charzon's and Gish was put on me as a child. I was always under his will. Even when he was dead it was strong enough to drive me along his road. But I love you, Koran. I will always love you. My love warred with Sharzan's will, even as I tried to kill you. And when I saw you lying there helpless after such a fight as no man has ever waged since the gods walked the earth, I tried to stab you. And I couldn't. Sharzan's English was broken. Her hands stroked his hair. You aren't too badly hurt, Corun. I'll get you down to the ship. With my witch's powers we can win through any Xanthi who try to stop us. Not that I think they will, with their leaders destroyed. We can get safely to Akera. She sighed. I will see that you escape my father's power, Corun. If you return to the pirate life, I will follow you. He shook his head. No, he whispered. No, I will take service under Croman if he will have me. He will, she vowed softly. He needs strong men, and some day you can be Thalassocrat of the Empire. It wasn't so bad, thought Corun drowsily. Croman was a good sort. A highly placed Conahorian could gradually ease the burdens of his people until they had full equality with Akera in a united and peaceful domain. The menace of Xanthi was ended. To be on the safe side, Akera had better make them tributary, an expedition which he, Korun, could lead. After that there would be enough to keep a man busy, as well as the loveliest and best of women for wife. He slept. He did not waken when Imazu led a squad up in search of him. Caresis laid a finger on her lips, and a flash of understanding passed between her and the captain. He nodded, smiling, and clasped her hand with sudden warmth. They bore the sleeping warrior back through the rain, down to the waiting ship. End of Part 10 End of Witch of the Demon Seas by Poole Anderson